What are electronic orbitals? Why do textbooks make them look like hard shells half the time and fluffy clouds the rest of the time? Why do they have weird gaps in them? And where can we see things like orbitals in the world around us? Keep watching to find out. Now, before we start, I need to say that electronic orbitals are fundamental concepts in quantum mechanics. And that means that there are simply no accurate and correct qualitative explanations of what they are. So I can show you equations and graphs, but as soon as we try and explain what they mean, we have to decide how inaccurate they're going to be. And the more correct those explanations are, the more inaccurate they are going to be. And the more accurate those explanations are, the less understandable they are going to become to anybody. So for now, I'm just going to say that an orbital is a space where we are likely to find an electron. And that space has the shape of an oscillation which is pinned to the nucleus at the center of an atom. And if you want a deeper explanation of why that is, make sure you hang around for the bonus extras at the end of this video. So how can we understand what we mean by an oscillation where we are likely to find something? Well, I've got a couple of demonstrations for you. So let's take a look. The first point I'm going to tackle is that orbitals only exist when there is an electron in them. So how can a space with a shape suddenly appear when an electron arrives? Well, let's start by having a look at this plaza. There's a kind of orbital for humans down there, and it's a big one. Can you see it? No? Well, that's because it doesn't exist without humans. So let's put some in. Now, what I'm doing here is stacking up photographs taken over a period of time. The human particles appear as slightly invisible ghosts. So places where we are more likely to find a human at any given time are darker than other places. In other words, we are creating a density plot of humans. And now you can see a kind of shape there. There are no roads or fences keeping people to that shape, but I knew it would be there. Why? because there are entrances to two big buildings at either end of that plaza, and people will tend to follow the lowest energy path between those two entrances. And that means that even though the square is mostly open and humans are free to go anywhere that they want, they are most likely to be following those low density paths, and that makes this shape in our density plot. And of course, we can find them in other places. It just means they will have to take more energy to go to those areas, and we will be less likely to find them there. And if we divide the photograph up into lots of tiny squares, we can use the darkness of each square to calculate a probability of finding a human there. And then we can plot a map of human density. And it's much easier to see that shape if we choose a minimum probability, let's say 10%, and just colour it in nice and solid. But remember, a more accurate depiction is a fuzzy cloud. And you can also imagine that if it was just one person, but we took the photographs over a longer time, say a few years, we would end up with the same kind of density plot. So this is our first example of something that is like an orbital. We just take a bunch of pictures over a long period of time, squash them all together. In other words, we're taking time out of our simulation and we get a space that spontaneously appears when there are particles in it because that space only appears as a result of those particles interacting with their environment. Now, the next demonstration is even better. But before I forget, if you could just click the like button, that'll help us make more videos. Thanks. 
Now for our next demonstration, we're going to take a trip to the Fukuoka City Science Museum. You see, I was there one day when I saw something that I really wanted to show you. So Mr. Hisao Tanaka, one of the senior demonstrators at the Science Museum, kindly allowed me to film it for you. And here it is. It's a plastic tube with some polystyrene balls at the bottom. Not impressed? How about now? So what's going on? Well, there's a speaker at one end of the tube and it's closed off at the other end of the tube. So if and only if the wavelength fits perfectly into the tube, we get a standing wave. So what's this got to do with electronic orbitals? Well, we can also use a wave function, in this case a simple sine function, to model the sound wave in this tube. And then we can use that same wave function to calculate the probabilities of finding polystyrene beads at certain places along the tube. In other words, if we find the nodes according to our wave function, then we are likely to find polystyrene beads there too. And that's similar to an electronic orbital. An orbital doesn't tell us exactly where an electron is. It's not a kind of solid container for, for electrons, but rather it tells us where an electron is most likely to be. Now, we could say that fractional waves don't fit, but it's more accurate to say that fractional wavelengths bounce up and down the tube and interfere with themselves to cancel themselves out. And you just don't get that stable pattern. Also in the tube, we can talk about a polystyrene bead density. And we could do that by taking just a few pictures of lots of beads, or we could do it by taking a lot of pictures of just one bead moving around. Well, we could, but actually that didn't work. And it didn't work because a single bead is moving along the bottom of the tube and that means friction stops it from fitting nicely into the nodes. But you can imagine how it would work. So in a similar way, we can talk about electron density. We might be talking about many electrons in a large space or just one electron in a small space. And understanding electron density is a big part of chemistry. And we can even get an idea about energy levels. You see, the beads are attracted to the bottom of the tube by gravity. So that means the higher up they are, the more gravitational potential energy they have. Now, two beads can't be in the same place, so we can, sort of, see discrete energy levels. And if a bead has a space underneath it, it'll drop down and lose its energy, and then it won't be able to get back up again. And that's just like electrons, losing their energy and falling down to a lower energy level and getting stuck there until they get some extra energy from somewhere else. And we can even see similar behavior with grains of sand with two-dimensional waves. There's lots of videos on YouTube, so I'll drop a couple of links in the description and you can check them out. Now, one of the big differences between this demonstration and electronic orbitals, of course, is that the sound tube is effectively one-dimensional, whereas electronic orbitals are three-dimensional and centered on a tiny point, the nucleus. But in three dimensions, waves don't just have a frequency, they have a shape. And there are only certain waves that we can attach to the tiny point of a nucleus. So that is why we find electrons in these strange shapes centered at the atom. And as we get further away from that nucleus, we find that the electrons in those orbitals have more potential energy, just like the beads at the top of the wave. So we've had one dimensional waves. Uh, I've linked to two dimensional waves. And the obvious next step was to go with three dimensional waves. And I spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to do that. And then I realized that there actually wasn't much point. Because this analogy is exactly wrong. 
And that's because the beads here are where the waves aren't. They're in the nodes. But in the Schrodinger equation, the electrons are where the waves are. It's exactly opposite. So a better way to visualize the Schrodinger equation with this demonstration is to take the negative of the video. And now we can see where the waves are in a way that corresponds to the wave function of the Schrodinger equation. Now there is a minority branch of physics called Bohmian mechanics, which treats electrons as if they are particles being carried on a wave. I've put a link in the description if you're interested, but it does seem that most physicists are convinced it's incorrect. So let's put these two demonstrations together and see what we get. We've seen that taking a chunk of time and squashing it together can show us a space where we have a high probability of finding a particle. And we've also seen that we can use the mathematics of a wave, a wave function, to predict the probability of finding a particle at a certain point in space. Even though that wave function doesn't tell us anything about how the particle actually moves. The Schrodinger equation combines these two things. The wave function gives us the shape of the orbital and the Hamiltonian operator relates that wave function to particle densities. So let's take the simplest possible atom, hydrogen. The wave function in the Schrodinger equation is the function of a stable wave pinned to that tiny nucleus at the center of the atom. Now, the simplest shape for doing that is a sphere. And as we increase the frequency or the energy, that oscillation will self-interfere and cancel itself out until we double the frequency. And at this point, we have a shell-like gap with almost no probability of finding electrons. And this is a node, just like the nodes that we saw in the sound tube. And as we continue increasing that frequency, the nodes become more significant and the sphere breaks into two halves, with each half having a different phase. I'm going to talk about phases in more detail for a different video, but for now you should already know about one-dimensional waves and phases, how one part of the wave put goes up and the other part of the wave goes down. And those crests and waves can interfere constructively and increase their amplitude or interfere destructively and cancel themselves out. And that'll be important to remember if you want to understand how atoms can come together, merge their orbitals and make molecules. Now let's talk briefly about the energy of orbitals. Because electrons are attracted to the nucleus, the more we pull them away from the nucleus, the more potential energy they have. And that's just like the polystyrene beads in the sound tube. As they were moved higher and higher in the sound tube, they were pulled away from their attraction to the ground and they had more and more potential energy. But because the oscillations that the electrons are sitting in are so much bigger than the nucleus, the electrons have to spend most of their time away from the nucleus. And the bigger the orbital is, the more time on average the electrons will be sitting even further away. So the larger the orbital, the more potential energy that electron must have. In addition, the more nodes that an orbital has, the higher its energy. And there are a couple of ways of thinking about this. First of all, waves with more nodes are higher in energy than equivalent waves with fewer nodes. But we could also imagine that an electron trying to follow a certain space needs more energy to follow a squiggly path than a simple circular path. A really important point to take away here though is that it's not the orbital that has the energy, it's the electron sitting in the orbital. And yes, I also say this is a high energy orbital, but that's because it's so much easier to say this is a high energy orbital than it is to say the electron sitting in this orbital has a high potential energy. 
Now, I haven't explained why you can only get two electrons in an orbital, and I'm not going to, because there are no good qualitative explanations for it. Yes, it's supposed to be about spin, and yes, you have to have gears that move in opposite directions to pair them together. But number one, electrons aren't spinning. And number two, you can connect as many gears in a line as you like. So for now, we're going to just be happy with the idea that you can only have two electrons in an orbital and they have to have opposite spins. All right, let's recap where we've got so far. Number one, we've seen that by stacking up images to squash down time, we can reveal a shape in space that only appears by the interaction of a particle with its environment. Number two, we've seen that we can use the mathematics of a wave to predict where we are likely to find a particle. And three, we can understand how orbitals with different sizes and different shapes can be associated with different potential energies. So what can we do with all that? Well, we can imagine taking photographs of an electron as it moves around in its orbital. And then we can imagine taking those photographs, stacking them up, and squishing time together, just like we did for the photographs of people in the plaza. Now, what we're really doing is calculating the probability of finding an electron around a nucleus using the Schrodinger equation. So where the oscillation vibrates the most is where we are most likely to find the electron. And then we distribute 300 points around our imaginary nucleus according to those probabilities. And this is what we get. You can see that we get a cloud effect. There's no solid container. The orbital itself doesn't have energy. It's just a space where we are likely to find an electron. But the average potential energy of that electron depends on which orbital it is occupying. So finally, we can understand that diagrams like this show us that cloud nature just with many more points. And we can also see that if we set a minimum probability of finding an electron, let's say 95%, we can draw a hard shell around that space. And that hard shell makes it easier for us to see the three-dimensional shape of the orbital, even though it might confuse us and make us think it's something solid. So there you go. An orbital is a space where we are most likely to find an electron. It has the shape of a three-dimensional oscillation centered on the nucleus. And it's not the orbital itself that has the energy, it's the electron sitting in that orbital that has the energy. OK, let's take a closer look at quantum mechanics. In our everyday macro scale world, particles and waves are completely different things. We can take a little ball and we can say exactly where it is. It's there and we can say where it's moving. It's going that way. But waves are completely different. If I make a wave right now, mm, where is it? Mm, where is it going? Well, we can't really talk about waves in that way. Where is it? Well, it's all around the room. And in fact, some of it is outside the room. And if we had a super sensitive microphone, we could be on the other side of the street and still detect the wave out there. So it's very difficult to say exactly where a wave is. And mm, where's it going? Well, it's kind of going backwards and forwards and... It's over there and over here anyway, so maybe it's not going anywhere, but still things are moving. So the words that we use for particles do not work with the way that we talk about a standing wave and vice versa. But on the scale of atoms and below, we can't make that distinction anymore. Sure, we can pin an electron into one place, but then we don't know where it's going. We fundamentally cannot talk about that the same way that we can't talk about which way is a standing wave going. And we can also get our electrons to behave like waves. We can get them to diffract and spread out. 
but then they arrive at a detector as a single point, which is something that waves cannot do. In other words, at that scale, we can no longer talk about particles and waves as being separate things. Rather, we have to say that our particles have a wave nature and a particle nature combined. And that's why there are no good qualitative explanations for quantum mechanics. Because there is nothing in our macro scale world that behaves like that. Sure, we can make our explanations more understandable, but the more we do that, the less accurate they are. And if we go the other way to make them more accurate, then the less understandable they are to anybody. So our final, more accurate explanation of what an orbital is, is that it's the wave nature of an electron oscillating around a nucleus. And the density plot is the particle nature of an electron flashing into existence for an instant without any way of knowing where it's going to show up next. In other words, the orbital and the electron are two aspects of the same thing. And if that doesn't make any sense to you right now, don't worry, physicists are still arguing about what it really means. So what do you think? Do you have a better way to explain orbitals? Would you like to hear about how orbitals come together to extend over a whole molecule or throughout a whole crystal? Are there any other concepts you'd like to hear about from chemistry? Let us know down there in the comments. And I'll see you next time.